hello and welcome everyone to our expert uh, uh, speaker series. And I'm very happy today to have Roger Garside, who will be speaking on China. Just a few housekeeping uh, um, housekeeping points. Um, first of all, everything that we just sort of discuss um, on this webinar is not meant to be uh, financial advice in any way, and not, nothing is based on any uh, private or non-public information. Um, and on top of that, this webinar is only for the members of, of MacroHive, and so hopefully um, it will allow us to uh, be a bit more interactive. So if you do have questions, just uh, click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your, your Zoom window and you can type in the, the question or you can just put it in, in the chat as well. And then while, um, while I'm asking questions, if I see a question that I think is interesting to ask at that point, I'll just ask that question as well. Um, so, so this should be a fun and uh, engaging conversation. And uh, just in terms of backgrounds, hopefully most people know me. So I'm Bilal Hafiz, I'm the CEO uh, of, of found, founder CEO of MacroHive. Um, I think I've hopefully interacted with, with most people who are attending uh, this, this webinar. But the more important person is our uh, is is our uh, guest, uh, Roger Garside. So Roger Garside has had quite a distinguished career. Notably, he was a diplomat for the British government and twice served um, at, the, at the British embassy in, in China. Um, and, in, and he's written a number of books on China. The latest uh, is called China Coup, uh, which is a, a great, uh, great title, a very provocative book on uh, potential regime change in, in China. And one of the reasons I wanted to give this opportunity for Roger to speak is he gives a perspective that I haven't really heard anywhere else on China. When most people talk about China, they talk about the stuff we all know, you know, about, you know, reforms in China, or they talk about, you know, bubbles in China or those sorts of things. But Roger really does have a different view. So I really did want uh, our members to, to, to hear uh, something about that. Um, so welcome, Roger. It's great, great to have you on. Um, let me just uh, unmute you. Uh, if you just unmute yourself, the classic sort of Zoom uh, issues here. So, Roger, if you just unmute yourself. Yeah, great. Right. Thank you, Bilal, for inviting me on. Great. Excellent. OK, so maybe we'll just kind of jump straight into it. Um, you know, maybe maybe I just wanted to start with a question, which is that, you know, this year there's been a bit of a polarized debate on China where you have some real heavyweights like BlackRock over the summer, you know, recommended to investors that they should boost their exposure to China by as much as three times. So there's these big financial organizations that are, are talking about increasing your exposure to China. Then at the same time, and coincidentally, around the same time, you have someone like George Soros, who warned that if you pour billions of dollars into China, it's a mistake. Um, and he kind of talked about uh, some of the geopolitics and national security interests um, that, uh, you know, would, would go against the US. So you have these two different views on, on China. So why do you think there's such a disagreement from, you know, very kind of credible institutions and people? Well, I think there are four reasons, major reasons for this disagreement. Uh, first, the strategy of the Chinese regime is undergoing the most radical change since Deng Xiaoping launched the reform era in 1978. Under the leadership of Xi Jinping, Deng's reform and opening is being replaced by regression and closure. Uh, and it's not yet clear how, just how far this will go. Secondly, I see a whole array of deep-seated problems in China produced by the totalitarian regime, the totalitarian character of this regime. It's not authoritarian, as most people say, it is totalitarian. And the most obvious of the problems is the debt mountain, uh, as in the case of the property development sector we're seeing uh, just now before our eyes unfolding. Um, Others are genocide in Tibet, Xinjiang, and Mongolia, overlooked by the free nations for a long time, but no longer. Public opinion is really waking up to the magnitude and horror of what is going on in Xinjiang. Um, suppression 
of freedom and rule of law in Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, financial institutions, too many of them, have, I, have chosen either to disregard these in the hope of making huge short-term gains or are simply ignorant of them. I think there's more willful blindness, um, perhaps due to the fact that some of the largest have poured resources into building up privileged positions, access to the China market, and they, they want to uh, get payoff for, for that. Um, thirdly, there is, I believe, by no means everybody agrees, very few people agree with me on this, but I detect signs of deep disagreement within the Chinese elite, both on domestic and international strategies that are being pursued by the Communist Party under Xi Jinping. Um, and this manifests itself in policies and actions that are sometimes unclear, contradictory, and even self-destructive, like wolf warrior diplomacy. Um, and fourthly, US strategy for its part um, has undergone a fundamental reorientation uh, from benign partnership with China to deep hostility. Um, it has accepted that there is a long-term threat from the Chinese communist regime to the national security interests of the US and other democracies. But I think that Wall Street still hopes to be able to ignore this. And you, you, you picked, uh, I just want to pick up on a word you used, a totalitarian. I mean, that seems like quite a old fashioned word from, you know, yeah. from the 40s or the 50s. And you made a distinction yeah. with authoritarian. Yes. Um, you know, and I assume there's intent behind using that word totalitarian. And so yeah. can you talk a bit more about what you mean by totalitarian, the importance of that and the consequences yes. of that? Um, well, you're quite right. It does. I wouldn't say it was old fashioned. I would say it's, it, it's uh, been, going, been around quite a long time and for very good reason. Um, uh, sadly, uh, totalitarianism, um, which we saw manifested in, in Nazi Germany and the uh, Soviet Union, um, is manifesting itself again now in China. What do I mean by the distinction? Um, to me, or not just to me, but I mean to the scholars in the field, like the great Anglo-American historian Robert Conquest, said that a totalitarian regime um, asserts its authority. Um, it, it, it demands um, acceptance of its authority in every sphere of life, um, but it, uh, of course, makes calculations about where it is feasible to impose that authority. And as China grows stronger, it is imposing its authority uh, more and more. But uh, the problem is with this, that um, totalitarianism cannot coexist with uh, freedom and the rule of law under democracy. Um, there can be short term accommodation, but there cannot be long term coexistence. Okay, und understood. And um, in terms of, you know, where people talk about, you know, how China could, you know, uh, as, as its economy uh, you know, grows, it will naturally become more democratic. I mean, there's this kind of Western notion, at least, that, yeah. you know, uh, growth, economic growth, or some yeah. form of capitalism naturally leads to democracy. I mean, is, is that something... You know, is, is that something you've seen in China or, or not? Yes, it is. And the Communist Party have seen it too, and they don't like it. <laughs> um, I mean, they launched um, uh, a transition towards a free market economy uh, back in the late 70s. And um, that liberated the 
energy and enterprise of the Chinese people to a huge extent, and we saw spectacular growth. But as the property-owning class grew and grew um, and traveled abroad, became more aware of other systems of government, sent their children to study in liberal democracies, um, uh, then uh, uh, and began to seek protection under law for their own property. Um, then um, the Communist Party saw a threat to their um, grip, their monopoly grip on power um, as, as the property owning class um, not only asserted itself, but wanted to expand the area of its uh, activities um, to take over the commanding heights, um, such as banking, insurance, uh, transport, utilities, which the Communist Party had reserved to itself and upon which it depends for patronage and sheer economic power. And, you know, in terms of timing, because obviously, you know, our audience are kind of investors, you know, in many of these charges you put about China being totalitarian, you know, controlling its population and yeah. such things, um, you know, that's, you know, you could have said that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, you know, what makes you think now is, is something a bit different from before? Um, I think that the, I think that the Communist Party um, leadership, um, those who were in power at, around the year 2008, um, collectively came to the view that um, an expanding private sector was dangerous to them, was undermining their authority. Um, I think they were very careful not to alert the outside world to that assessment that they had reached. They still wanted access to our capital, to our technology, um, and um, so they were um, very careful to keep us quite confused about what was really going on in, in China and their reassessment of things. Um, and, you know, that, that bred a certain complacency uh, in America as well as in Europe and Japan. And that the, there came an awakening during the Trump administration, a kind of intellectual awakening came and we heard about his pivot to Asia, but not much was done till the Trump administration came to power and put hawks, China hawks into crucial positions in the administration. And they shook up policy towards the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and, I, and Europe is now awakening too. Okay, understood. Yeah. So, yeah. so basically, we have, you know, a move away from the private sector, you know, since the global financial crisis from since 2008, yes. we've had a greater awareness from Western powers about trying to contain China. And then within China, there's more centralization, a kind of cult of personality that's occurring under President Xi. Now, yeah. in your book, you lay out a possible path for a coup d'etat to occur. And that, for me, yeah. an interesting angle you have, which I think is different from what outsiders have, is that this won't be a bottom-up popular revolution to take out President Xi, but yeah. the way a coup, uh, a way a regime change would occur in China would be that other elites, other yeah. people at the highest levels, would, yes. would uh, engage in a coup to remove President Xi. Um, yeah. So what, you know, how would that work? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. what makes you think that's the path that this could happen? And, and you know, what are some of the mechanics of that? Right. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I don't 
as you accurately say, I don't foresee um, a grassroots, bottom-up um, uh, revolt, uh, a rebellion against the regime. Uh, this is a regime which is extremely good at control. Uh, it's good at uh, brainwashing. Um, and um, uh, for the most part, the population is not going to, uh, is not rebellious. Um, that could change um, if, well, we could go there into that later. That could change, but at the moment that is the case. But there's evidence that within the upper reaches of the Communist Party, of the elite that rules China, there is dissatisfaction um, with the system as it stands, and particularly with the direction in which Xi Jinping is leading them. Um, I mean, I've mentioned that he has replaced Deng Xiaoping's strategy of reform and opening with regression and closure. And he has, and present policies have alienated the most powerful country in the world. And uh, there are there's a substantial percentage of the upper and middle officials of the Communist Party of China who see this as overreaching um, and um, creating risks for China and for their own power and wealth. They haven't ha undergone some kind of Damascene conversion to uh, the beauties of uh, liberal democracy, but um, they can see that they are prisoners of a totalitarian system um, which is no longer delivering the goods. In fact, it's producing um, some risks to the stability and economic health of China, and I've enumerated some of them. So um, we have witnesses, we have witnesses to this. Uh, the highest level defector from China to the United States in the history of communist China since 1949, a professor, uh, Tsai Xia, who taught political ideology at the Central Party School to the senior and middle ranking officials for 15 years. She is on the record as saying that 60 to 70% of the upper level cadres of the Communist Party um, regard constitutional democracy as a better system for, e for social stability and the defense of human rights. And that's why they're sending their sons and daughters to universities in the liberal democracies. That's why they're using every possible means to get as much of their wealth out and invested elsewhere as they can, because they do not have confidence in the future of the regime they serve. Okay, and, and in terms of some of the characters that could be involved in the coup, I mean, who, who are the players you're looking at? Like, who, who, right. who higher up? Like, yeah. you know, who, well, who are the I, I carefully researched the top leadership of the Communist Party, and I selected three to lead the coup. The Prime Minister, himself, Li Keqiang, and I'll come back to why, uh, in particular, I chose him. Um, then a vice premier, Wang Yang, um, who has a lot of economic uh, policy experience and was the boss of South China, Guangdong province, for years. And he demonstrated um, a willingness to look at not only economic, but political reform during that time. And thirdly, uh, the vice president of China, Wang Qishan, Xi Jinping's oldest friend in the top leadership, but a man of independent mind, very sharp, very capable, very uh, good understanding of um, Western financial systems and the people who run them. So those three uh, I, I identified. 
And curiously enough, um, the same three people have been identified by bloggers on the Chinese social media. <laughs> um, I was astonished when I saw that, but um, uh, very pleased and, uh, and reassured in my choice. Um, so um, I see them um, waiting a, an opportunity to strike. It won't happen unless the US and its allies exert external force, pressure, not military force, but economic pressure on China. We have economic superiority over China. We have some great assets, uh, like the control of the international banking system, like reserve, major, the major reserve currencies, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know this. Um, and we have to deploy those in ways that will embolden and enable them, uh, th these kinds of people that I've mentioned, create the conditions where they, they feel emboldened and enabled uh, to move. And already uh, the US has, uh, without declaring this as their objective, moved in that direction, uh, both in um, the measures taken to limit the export of dual technologies and the transfer of dual technology um, for, or military technologies also from um, the US to China, Huawei, the prime example, but also they're moving to enforce the disclosure of financial information that Chinese companies listed and traded in the US um, have long been required to disclose by law, but been prevented by the Chinese government from doing so. Well, as I'm sure many of your audience be aware, um, legislation was passed by uh, the US Congress and signed into law um, in the last days of Trump, which will um, lead to the suspension and from listing and trading in the US of Chinese companies um, who fail to continue to fail to disclose financial information in full measure. Okay, no, that's great. So, so, so my sense from what you're saying is there's certain players within the upper echelons of the political system within China, the, the, the prime minister and the two Wongs are kind of, yeah. could orchestrate a coup, but you also need the external conditions and yeah. essentially Trump kind of set up a framework almost uh, yeah. to economically contain China you know, we're kind of seeing the effects of some of that with China kind of voluntarily delisting some companies to to sort of yes. sidestep these rules. But if Biden was to step it up and, you know, impose further restrictions on China's access to yes. capital, then that could, you know, increase the chances of this uh, regime change. Well, I think if it, if it if if the legislation, which is already in place, entitled holding foreign companies to account um, uh, is implemented with its full force, that will create a crisis, a confrontation between the US and China. Um, and uh, that would, that financial capital market confrontation would rapidly become a political confrontation. And I believe it would lead to a political crisis in China, uh, which would play into the hands of those who have long believed that Xi Jinping's been overreaching. Okay, understood. And I'm not sure if you've read the book Red Roulette by Desmond Shum or not. You know, so he was kind of an insider, you know, whose wife was, you know, connected to uh, Hu Jintao, I think it was. Um, uh, Wen Jiabao. Uh, Wen, Wen Jiabao, sorry. Um, yes. And she kind of disappeared. And now sort of Desmond Shum's yeah. written a book about his experience you know, yeah. being so close to the elites. Have, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that book, if you've read it. Well, I, I've read the book and I've given lunch to uh, 
Desmond Shum and his partner um, uh, at the Reform Club, and we had a very good we had a very good uh, hour and a half or a couple of hours together. Um, and um, I think it's a, a, a very I mean it's a very interesting book because here we have really for the first time. Uh, somebody who has been at the heart of, at the very nexus of politics and uh, economics in, in, in China, economic activity in China. Um, and Desmond is by no means a political uh, operator. Um, he left the polit political relationship building to his former wife, uh, now uh, apparently being a held um, in some kind of house arrest or arrest. Um, and uh, so this is the first time we've had a kind of insider's uh, account of this. Um, and um, uh, I think it's a very well-written book um, and uh, a, a quick and good read. And I commend it to uh, your audience. Yeah, I mean, what I found interesting about that book was just the level of kickbacks and corruption that's, uh, you know, that's prevalent in China amongst the upper sort of political elite. Everybody's got a finger in the pie. Um, and so if, you know, the economic engine slows down or if that's compromised, I could imagine these people thinking, look, hang on, my, my gravy train's over. So I'm not happy with, uh, you yes. know, with, with the current uh, regime, uh, in President Xi's regime. So there was, it was kind of an interesting insight into to how China operates at that level. There is a, there's been in operation uh, since, really, since the beginning of the reform era, a Faustian pact between uh, the Communist Party and um, the economic entrepreneurs of China, or the people of China, you know, the people uh, say, we let you rule and you let us make money. Um, and uh, I mean, that actually goes for, for members of the Communist Party as well as uh, those outside it. Um, and the, I, I think that the um, pact has been under strain increasingly since 2008 and since the great financial crash. Um, when at first uh, China um, impressed us all and helped us all by pumping uh, credit into the economy and maintaining a high level of economic activity and a growing level of uh, economic activity. But that of course has been continued past the point when it really ought to, from an economic health point of view, have been stopped. And hence the uh, huge debt mountain, so great that no country um, has ever succeeded in reducing a mountain of this debt mount of this size without either recession or inflation. No, thanks for that. Now, I'll, I'll take some questions from the uh, the audience as well. There's one question here, um, which we kind of touched on, uh, but it'd be good if you could elaborate. Does uh, President Xi, does he need foreign capital? And if so, how much of his doctrine, that is sort of centralized economic control, disrespect for the rule of law, is he prepared to compromise on to, to kind of keep the capital coming in? Very good question. Um, I, I, China has needed uh, foreign capital, has made uh, good use of foreign capital, and has, and companies, Chinese companies have shown until very recently, no sign of letting up on applying for licensing uh, for IPOs in the US and elsewhere, but particularly the US. Um, they, they wanted that capital. Um, I think quite a lot of them, one big motive of it was they were, the, the entrepreneurs wanted to acquire capital beyond the reach of the Communist Party. And so they, could ra they were raising you know, billions of US dollars, which they were... In, uh, free to um, spend 
as they saw fit, including buying um, politicians in China, but uh, also using it outside China. Um, and I think that Xi Jinping um, moved against that, not for economic reasons, not because there was no longer need for foreign capital in China, um, but in order to assert the authority of the regime. And this is the totalitarian regime um, clamping down on um, activities beyond its control. Now, is he prepared to backtrack from that? And um, uh, no sign of it. Um, it looks as though he, he is going ahead with that. Um, and it must have created a lot of dissatisfaction amongst the entrepreneurial class in China and amongst many um, people in the regime who, through their friends in business, have built up multi-million, multi-billion um, uh, fortunes in this way. Okay, okay, that's good. I mean, there's another question which is just wants to kind of just press a bit more on terms of the risks of uh, Xi losing control. So we've kind of talked about one which you just alluded to now, which is that economic actors within China or private sector entrepreneurs feeling heavily under pressure, losing their wealth, they could be one source of attack against regime. Another would be external if the US further tightens the screws and, and forces uh, Chinese companies to disclose more and, and, and so you know, force them to reform. But what about other factors like demographics or environmental issues, those sorts of things? I mean, is, are, is that a potential source of risk for Z, uh, Z as well? Um, well, the demographic one is um, uh, absolutely major break on future China's growth, but um, questionable what, how much of an impact that'll have over, say, the next five years. But um, I, I mean, I think much more worrying for everybody inside China and outside China is the environmental problem. Um, the, again, this traces back to the totalitarian system. Um, in order to um, control China um, <clears throat> uh, and win and retain the tolerance of the people, um, which even totalitarian regimes have to do, they have given priority of, to economic growth over environmental um, control and pollution control. Um, and their rhetoric notwithstanding, that is still the case. Um, the whole uh, incentive system for promotion, for um, Communist Party officials at every level, and it has long prioritized economic growth over um, environmental control. Um, and a, uh, one aspect of this, which is particularly dangerous, is the great and growing dependence on coal to generate power. And although they have actively sought and vigorously sought and efficiently sought to uh, develop um, green sources of, of energy. Um, the scholarship, scholarly studies that I've read have persuaded me that um, neither wind nor um, solar in China is going to do away with the need for reducing the reliance on coal and that they, on present policies, they're headed for disaster. And that means disaster for all of us because they are the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases on this planet. Okay, um, and there's another question. This, uh, this question uh, relates to kind of the delisting issue. So, you know, at the moment, Chinese companies use structures like VIEs and ADRs to, um, to 
essentially list in, in foreign ex- in um, U.S. exchanges and capture foreign capital. Um, will do you think the Chinese government will essentially try to ban those those instruments completely and force everyone to delist and and come onshore into China, or do you think they'll kind of have this steady state where VIEs will still be allowed? Um, but it will be, uh, you know, uh, the, the government will periodically come in and delist one company, say. Well, I, this is a, a topic that I'm sure many of us are following on a day-to-day basis. Um, the latest public signs that we see out of China um, are, uh, you know, I mean, sort of the, the, the briefing of, well-placed journalists in China, Tsai Sin, uh, the financial magazine, um, what the, it seems to be in the wind is prohibiting future use of VIEs, um, but not um, uh, damaging, not, not uh, um, acting against those Chinese companies uh, listed and traded abroad, thanks to having put VIEs in place. But of course, the US for its side might move against VIEs. I mean, after all, shareholders have been show, sold instruments which do not allow them to control the companies they bought the instruments uh, to which they're related. Um, uh, and uh, Wall Street's kept very quiet about all that all these years, but you know people are waking up to the fact, uh, to the facts now. And I think quite a lot. Of, I think public opinion is moving on this. Okay, so that's okay. That's that's interesting. So essentially, your your senses and your reading of of the the, the noise we're getting out of China is that uh, new companies uh, won't be able to use VIEs, that, that's kind of a no-go yep. for, for the future, but existing ones can, will still exist. And the risk for those probably comes more from the US side of the yep. US clamping down and, uh, and actually applying the same level of regulation as any other yep. company that's listed uh, other than yep. through this. Okay, no, that's, yep. that's good. Um, we have another question. This is actually changing a bit for the, the topic, um, and this is on Taiwan. Um, so will President Z kind of use like some kind of um, assault on Taiwan in some way as a way to consolidate his own power. So is, you know, how, how does kind of Taiwan fit into your, your view of, of, of China at the moment? Well, I mean, I can see why um, the question has been raised because um, the Chinese regime has been extremely public and extremely assertive and extremely threatening towards Taiwan. And it's upped its rhetoric and it's increased the number of flights uh, over the um, um, air defense uh, zone um, uh, around Taiwan. Um, And of course, they are uh, very concerned about the shift in opinion, both within Taiwan and in the rest of the world regarding Taiwan, not least in Japan and South Korea. Um, And there are those who think that um, Xi Jinping will be, will want to move against Taiwan sooner rather than later. Um, But I'm skeptical of that. Um, The risks are huge and frankly, I think unquantifiable. Um, and the power of the U.S. and its allies to retaliate militarily, but also economically, is devastating. And I think I've always taken the view. And uh, good luck uh, investing in crypto markets. The communist regime in China has, has done in the South China Sea and in its pressure on Taiwan is Uh, largely for domestic political purposes to mobilize nationalism behind the regime rather than um, a sign of an early 
assault on the island. And um, if, if other people have questions, feel free to ask. I have, I have one or two questions. Um, one is, um, if, if there was a regime change of some kind, you know, and, you oh. know, if some, you know, these, yeah. uh, you know, some of the existing elites sort of took over, um, no. do, do you think that would be positive economically for, for China? I'm just trying to get a sense of if suddenly tomorrow no. you wake up and you see Xi's out no. initially there'll be probably a sell-off but then people will try to work out is this positive economically for china i mean how, how would you yeah. uh you know well, how would you view that um of, of course it all depends on um how the coup is conducted and how okay, the, yeah. the um transition to democracy which i predict is launched um but i am cautiously confident that it would be um, smoothly and peacefully handled. Um, I think we're looking at very adroit, very skilled, very experienced political operators who would be very well um, prepared. Now, uh, what would the economic effects of all that be? I think positive. Um, I think that, uh, that uh, there'd be the economic effects, the social effects, um, uh, any kind of effects you name in terms of human rights, whatever, I think would be positive across the board, but yes, including the economic effects, because um, democracy, democracy would bring the rule of law and um, economies flourish in the rule of law, with the rule of law, and there would be, uh, the economy would be on a much sounder basis. I mean, China, as we can see now, um, with the property sector problems, 29% of the of GDP in property sector development, and here we have the second largest company um, in limited default, as defined um, by a rating agency. Um, we this is going to create very severe. Um, problems for local governments raising finance. They used to be able to raise it hitherto by land sales. That's going to be a much less fruitful pass, path to maintenance of local government. So that, that before regime change takes place or as it takes place, there could be severe disruption. But um, in the longer term, a democratically elected government um, would be able to uh, mobilize resources. They could make the shift from dependence on investment in infrastructure and exports to a more consumption-led uh, e economic growth model because they could use um, the mobilization of public uh, opinion through uh, democratic elections to redistribute uh, capital and income from the present um, elites, particularly uh, not least at the regional level, um, and thereby give consumption a greater role and a, a, in a healthier economy. Just one example. Okay, great. Okay, now I'm going to sort of round, round off, round this off by putting you on the spot a bit and asking you if you had to assign a probability to yeah. a coup occurring, say in the next, yeah. say two, three years, um, you know, what what probability would you assign? Um, I would. Um, uh, I so much depends on uh, um, the U.S. and allies as well as on what goes on domestically in China. Um, I would say within the next three years, I would assign a probability of 20%. If you take us out to five years, I would assign a probability much nearer to 50%. Let's say, yeah, let's say 50%. Okay, no, that's that's very useful. Okay, so that's great. I mean, so that seems okay. So so it's twenty to possibly fifty percent next three to five years. And from our conversation, yep. what I've learned is 
a big swing variable here is how the US plays this. So if the US really yeah. does turn the screws, especially through capital markets and the economy, yeah. and that probability goes up. Internally yeah. within China, there are sort of players at the highest levels who are ready to act if needed. Yeah. But uh, what's important is how the business class, how it kind of how, how they feel like their wealth has been taken away and they could act yes. as an internal agent of change. Um, yes. And so that, that's the internal factor to kind of look at. Um, okay, no, that, that, that's kind of great. And I, I would just add that you can hopefully uh, the audience can see uh, Roger's book, uh, China Coup, behind him. So I would urge people to get hold of his book. It's, it's a great read. It's written really, really well as kind of a, like a gripping thriller almost of, of like real time how, how a coup would occur, the players and, and so on. And, and you know, as, as, as hopefully everyone has seen from our conversation, it, this is quite a different type of conversation we're having on China than what you normally hear, which is, you know, other conversations tend to be much more conventional, but we're able to accommodate such divergent views because we're not, you know, attached to any big financial institutions. So we can have these sorts of discussions, um, although they, at this stage, it might be low probability, but I think it's, it's worthwhile thinking, thinking out how these scenarios would, would unfold. Um, so, so with that, Roger, thanks a lot. You've been great. I've learned a lot uh, speaking to you again. Hopefully, it's been very good for our audience as well. Um, so, you know, just just over to you for any sort of final words if you have any. Well, thank you very much indeed, Bilal. Um, as before, you are a superb interviewer. It's a delight to talk with you. I would uh, just add that um, I think the value of the book is not only uh, in the entertainment value or the excitement <laughs> of reading the, the, the coup scenario, but also the other three quarters of the book, which is sober fact-based analysis. Um, so it's nonfiction and it distills into, I think rather few pages, um, a lot that uh, people may not read, but which certainly they don't read in the daily or weekly newspapers. That's excellent. Thanks a lot, Roger. And thanks a lot, everyone in the audience. Hope, hope everyone's enjoyed this. And if, if people do have follow-up questions for Roger, just ping me and I'll, I'll try to get in touch with Roger to answer those questions. Absolutely. So thanks, everybody. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of the day. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you Bye. and goodbye.